Shows. I'm your host, Mark Stetson. This is the new and revamped PitCast since the unfortunate departure of our good friend Rob Gilbert before I went out from a homie. Don't worry, it's not alcohol. It's 10 in the morning, folks. No, it's apple juice. I'm still a 10-year-old boy trapped in a 29-year-old man. So, drinking my mats. And doing some pit casting. Um, we have a really, really cool, <coughs> pardon me, I'm sick, a little bit of a sinus infection. Don't get too close, guys. Might get a little bit of the cyanide. We have a very exciting show for you today. We have Matt Freed and Phil Casal talking about the most recent pit production of the Charlie Brown Apocalypse. Perhaps the final production of the Charlie Brown Apocalypse, um, which uh, began... A year ago, when Matt Fried challenged himself to write and produce and put up a reading of a play in an entire month. And he did it uh, with a bunch of other uh, fellow pitizens. And then um, more came on for the eventual run in the beginning of this year and then uh, a remount back in November. So um, we have both Matt and Phil talking about the show, talking about their experience. And um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. The apocalypse is here, guys! It's the best holiday ever! I mean, sure, some godless heathen will be like, Chuck Black, are you nuts? And I'd just be like, nope, prepare to burn, sinner. <laughs> we here at Anonymous are by far, without question, the most Christian town in the whole country. We don't dance. We don't cuss, and we certainly don't use condoms. <laughs> or, as my dad likes to call them, Satan's rain jackets. <laughs> well, right now, it might seem a little odd that everybody in Anonymous is running to Christ Co. left and right, spending money, but that doesn't mean we've forgotten the holiday spirit. In fact, for every thousand dollars spent today at Christ Co., they pledge to graffiti a Planned Parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> they really know what it means to be Christian. <laughs> but right now, today, today is more than just waiting for the end of the world. Today is about coming together with your friends and your family and just being one with God. I mean, who wouldn't want that, right? You know, it was funny. I was back home because, you know, Thanksgiving was just last week. It's a weird thing to think that, um, it's, that, like, it's over. It's not like it's over, over, but, like, that this year has kind of come to a close. This year with the show and everything has come to a close. And, like, it's been hitting me in different ways, but I haven't been getting super emotional about it. And then, um, I was sitting in the couch of the den of my parents' house, which used to be my room, and I turned on the TV 
and what comes on but like a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and and Mark I kid you not like within not even a minute and a half I was just like bawling like a baby because I was like <laughs> <laughs> I kid you. Old softy. Take us from the inception of Charlie Brown. The inception. Um, okay. So I committed to doing the reading before I even had the idea for the script altogether, uh, if you can believe it. I was... I, I, I just started writing again around this time last year, so it was like early, late October, early November. And um, I, Jeff Lapine was still the artistic director at The Pit, and I emailed Jeff and I said, hey, do you have any dates available at the end of December? Jeff gave me December 30th, which was the date that ended up being the reading, um, and I was originally going to do a variety show there, but I eventually decided, I'm like, nope, if I'm writing some new stuff, why don't I just write a, a whole full-length script? Because everything else I was doing was short stuff. And I said to myself, well, why don't I write it in about a month? So I knew I was going to write something full-length, and I knew that I had a set date. It was like the very end of November was when I was going to sit down and write it, and I knew there was going to be at least four weeks in writing it. And... Um, the idea for the show literally came out of um, me just sitting there and just brainstorming. And I literally brainstormed most of it sitting on a plane going out to L.A. for the first time to go visit uh, my friend from high school, Jim Campolongo, who's a very successful TV writer now. And um, it was literally like December 30th, 2012, end of the world, Mayan talk show, Mayan whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then it just hit me as like I'm just going spitballing. Through. I'm like, what if you did like a pageant? <laughs> show about the apocalypse like with little kids and I remember sitting there talking with Jim about it in his apartment and, and I said I was like yeah you know it would kind of be like Charlie Brown and Jim I have to give credit to he was the one who actually said I was like well dude like I think it's a really funny idea but he said like I think like it can't be like Charlie Brown it has you should it should be Charlie Brown right so that was basically like how the inception of it happened and then the technique of it um, I, uh, I if I if I could pitch a class for the pit um, I learned a lot in uh, Sarit Katz's sitcom writing class, which she still teaches here okay. at the Pit, um, I, I got a lot out of that. So, like, I knew already like how to do a br- how to do um, um, a beat sheet and how to break things down into um, an outline and whatnot. And then when I was out in LA, Jim showed me a couple of things that he likes to do in terms of building a script. And that was kind of how I began to uh, develop the plot and develop some of the themes and develop the characters. And then that basically took me through from the beginning of December until literally about December 21st or 22nd. I was back home in Haddonfield, New Jersey, my hometown. And I remember sitting in, um, the same den that used to be my room. And I remember finishing the first draft of Charlie Brown. And I remember sitting of Charlie Brown Apocalypse. I remember sitting there and reading it and, uh, it was complete shit <laughs> I was just I was just like and I was in total freak out mode too because like I wrote because I wrote this thing and it was it was a it, looking back I was like it was a clear, clearly just a first draft but it was also like at that time I had made contact with all of you guys mm-hmm. and I had four days to get you guys a script and I'm literally <laughs> sit, staring at this thing that I had spent I'd spent almost four weeks pour, pouring my heart and soul into I'm like it's sure. complete shit oh my god so I was like alright well what am I gonna do and I'm just like alright well Freed you gotta Dude, you got. You can either back out. You can either back out, or you can see this thing through to the end. And so I literally went back to my outline, and the thing that I noticed immediately was that I didn't know who the characters were at all. And I, so I literally went through the entire script and like through every single character: Chuck Black, minus Mocha Mint Mel, Rufus, all of them. I was literally like, "What does this character want? What does this character right. fear? What are the things? What are the various um, actions or objectives?" or not objectives, but what are the various actions that they do in order to achieve their objective and, and avoid their fear. And I learned literally through that, through that crash course. And I did this all in one night too. I got maybe four hours of sleep that night. And thank God I was on vacation at the time too. Um, (laughs) and then I literally like once I had, once I had a clear idea of what the wants and fears of each of these characters were and how they might interact with one another in order to achieve these and have a sense of what the relationships with the characters were, I then literally went back through the first draft of the script and scene by scene I was like, what is the point of this scene? What's supposed to happen in this scene? And then what came out of that was a second draft of Charlie Brown, which I would say about 65% of what was in the second draft has made it through to the final draft, and then I did a third pass on it in literally about barely two nights and by and I think within four days I cranked out three different drafts of the script that I got to you guys for the reading wow and I remember it was literally like I remember 
the first set of rewrites I did, I did 15 pages of rewrites in about two hours, and then I did another 10 pages of rewrites the next night in roughly about two hours. And this was Christmas Eve night, Christmas night, and I was so wiped out that I did a little bit on like December 26th, and then I remember literally sitting at my kitchen table at like 12.30 in the morning on the morning of December 28th when I had come back to New York and I had just worked the full day, and like I literally finished it, and then I emailed it to all you guys, and I was just like, and here's my balls on the table. <laughs> Let's see where it goes from there. So, in brief, big Harry Matt Fried balls. Big Harry Matt Fried balls. Well, you have to remember for kids. Like, for kids, totally. Um, <laughs> you have to remember, like the thing that was like truly nerve wracking for me with it. Um, I'm, I'm I'm finally now able to, to to call it what it is and comfortable talking about was that prior to that I'd done a show here called the Matt Fried Hour, and that show more or less really ended up being my first real professional failure that I ever, that I'd ever really endured. Uh, not just at the pit, but but like but in like doing it around theaters in general and in New York, and it was so bad of a failure that like it really set me back, and like I had to take time off and like really figure out. I took like I, I sat on the sidelines for like two years just figuring out like what my next move was going to be really. Wow. Um, so to put myself through this pressure of like not pressure, but to give myself this assignment of writing it in thirty days and then putting it out there, I was literally at this point where I just was just like. I was just in fuck it mode mostly. Can I can I curse on this? Oh yeah. I was just in fuck it mode where I was literally just like whatever. It's like I've had I've done the worst of the worst type of shows where like if I was lucky one person showed up to this thing after I spent thirty days working outside. It's like I've poured my heart and soul into this. I've gotten I've I've somehow convinced a couple of actors to get on a stage and read it. I if this thing turns out horribly, like I I I, I at least I tried. That's all I can mm -hmm. say. At least I tried, and I'll go. I'll go back to school and get like a graphic art design degree or something like that or something. But then literally, yeah, like we gave to you guys and then I don't, by, by the grace of God, the, the reading ended up selling out at, at like an 11, an 11 o'clock show on December 30th in New York City. Yeah. Like it completely sold out. I still don't know where all those people came from. Yeah, I don't either. Like I don't think they were real. Those people, I think, just existed for a night. I said to my parents after the, because uh, I would say to my parents because they were there with the I'm like, how much did you pay these people? Like how <laughs> much? But yeah, like they loved it though. Like, people loved... went nuts for it. Oh my god! And I, like that was the biggest satisfaction of the world. Like oh my god! It's like oh my god! This actually works. So, from that point on, from the point of the. Of the reading of December 30th of last year. Yeah. Till uh, the final show, was it November 14th? No, it? Yeah, November 14th. How do you feel like it ended up? Um, you mean I, you, you haven't gotten the sense from the drunken posts I put up on Facebook about it? <laughs> um, no, I think it's I think it's gone incredibly well. I mean, there's the practical side of it in that um, obviously the show for in theater terms was a success in that more than one person came out to come see the show, which was nice. <laughs> But I feel like this show ultimately gave me back everything that I felt like I, I really lost with doing the Matt Freed Hour. And I don't mean that to sound I don't make that I don't mean that to say like, oh, woe is me or what a pitiful time in my life. But I, I something that for a long time after I did that show, I really was very angry at myself that like I was I clearly had a a, a Viking a sinking Viking death ship of a of a show idea on my hands and yeah. I was too stubborn to kind of let it sink when it needed to sink and I let it go on a lot longer than it needed to. And now I think with that balance by like Charlie Brown Apocalypse, a show in which like I, I took myself out of the equation of a lot of things. Like I just made myself the writer and producer in the show and I said that's all I'm gonna do with this. And I've really opened myself up to collaborating with you guys, and 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 I have, I I have to give a lot of thanks to one of my my good friend and one of my oldest colleagues, Christine Liz Penn, who who was there throughout all of the Matt Fried Hour and saw the shit that I went th that we went through, and still took one look at the script of Charlie Brown and said, "I want to help you produce this." And she was my co-producer for the run that we did at the Crane and the summer show that we did here at the Pit. Um, I feel like that from all that. I realized that A, in terms of the Matt Fried Hour, it's like, well, no, if you're really going to appreciate, it's like, you only really learn to value what you have when you've gone through that type of failure in the first place, so it's necessary to, to go through that type of failure to evolve as a human being, I think. And then B, as I said before, I feel like everything that didn't happen with the Matt Fried Hour happened with Charlie Brown Apocalypse. And that gave me back, A, a lot of confidence as a writer. It gave me back a lot of confidence as a producer. It, gave, it let me know that it's like, okay, I can collaborate with people and I can 
learn when to set my ego aside and just simply kind of walk into like if somebody comes to me with an idea about something like a lot of the, like a lot of the work that you and Toby did when you guys were with the show and you brought this insane chemistry to the characters of Humbert and Minus which honestly when I was rewriting the script when we were doing the first round of the show like I was just like all right well what's going to work for Toby and Mark all right I'll just do it this way <laughs> um, that was something that I wasn't able to do 3 or 4 years ago and so I feel like as I said like this show gave me back a lot of things that I lost with doing the Matt Fried hour but Loss because of the fact that you know it's it's all trial and error and pragmatic stuff of like all right it, it's like that doesn't work let's try this if that doesn't sure. work let's try this so on and so forth you know that's kind of it goes back to that it goes back to like that old improv that old improv principle of like if if this is true then what else is true right right so having this show under your belt and I'm sure there's a lot of writers who are just starting or just coming up who either have a script or have an idea for it and mm -hmm. they. Yeah, you know, they either haven't done it or they don't believe in themselves or you know for whatever whatever. Um, you know, people who were in your seat, you know, a year, year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, what what advice would you bestow onto onto them? Um, I would basically say, uh, and putting this in the most polite but blunt terms, uh, put up or shut up. That's really what it does come down to. I mean. Um, I, you know, the only reason, the only reason why I even wrote Charlie Brown Apocalypse in the first place was because I said to myself, like, I just said to myself, fuck it. And I just said, uh, you know, I'm giving myself 30 days. I'm going to write something. I'm going to put it up in front of an audience and it's going to happen one way or the other. The worst, I remember, I remember when I was a kid, there was this girl that I, I was in love with in eighth grade and I was too afraid to ask her out. And I remember talking to my grandmother about it. My grandmother said, Matt, the worst thing she can say is no. And by the way, she said no several times. Um, <laughs> she said, the worst thing she can say is no, and then you will just move on with your life and it'll be fine. I, it's the same thing here. It's like the worst thing that's going to happen is that you'll write, you'll write something um, and maybe, you know, like maybe 10 people will come out to come see it or maybe you'll get a full house and, you know, things won't hit as, as well as you wanted them to hit or whatnot. You know what? That's part of the process of learning how to get better. Like you need you need to get you need to get socked in the mouth a couple of times to figure out like what's gonna work and what's not gonna work for you. And and, and I'm I'm really of that I am of that, that school of thought of like, look, all notes are good notes. You have to learn how to parse out what what, what you think makes sense and you have to parse out like what you think, what makes sense to you in terms of what you were going for originally versus what's really just somebody who just is not 100% getting it. And I'm really of that idea that like, look, I mean, one of the invaluable resources of The Pit is that The Pit is the only theater I know of in, in the city where you can literally directly email Keith Wong and Toby Nopes in the front office and say, I, ha I want to do this thing. I want to do a reading. I want to do a one night or two night um, performance of the show that I'm writing like when can I bring it to the pit like every I mean every other place it's literally like you need to have a backer or you need to go through this long drawn out application process or you know this is the only place where you can literally just email somebody and be like hey I've got this thing that I've been working <laughs> on and you're not going to do anything to take a look at it will you give me an opportunity and they will say yes we'll give you an opportunity they'll say we'll give you an opportunity on our terms in terms of what works for us but they'll still give you an opportunity one way or the other. That's absolutely true. They've done that with me a couple of times. Yeah. You know, with a couple of my shows and show ideas. And like it's it's like, wait, really? I, all I have to do is right. ask? Well, and you'll give me a space? Yeah. The Christine Denoon and Laura Steele show, Someone to Belong to. They're, they're, right. That's an original musical. And it's literally like, like they've got two, they got two spots on a... They got two spots on the main stage. You want to know how they got that? They emailed Keith and they just and they pitched it to him and they asked. That's basically how it went down. While they were right. that's the same thing that happened with Charlie Brown. I mean, it literally was, it was literally like, hey Keith, I have this show that's been running down at the crane. Like, can I can I bring it to the pit? And literally, you know, the rest is pretty much history yeah. at this point. So I would basically say, I would say, if you have something and if you really genuinely want to be good as a writer. If you want to be good as a writer, if you want to get better at the writer, utilize the resources you have. Put yourself in a position where you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. And I would say do it in any case. And 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 if it sucks, so be it. And if it's amazing, awesome. Yeah. But but take notes and learn lessons and push yourself. For God's sake, push yourself. You know. It's great. And what what do you have coming up? 
What I have coming up, um, uh, funny you should mention that, Mark. Uh, I am writing a uh, original TV pilot right now. Um, it is going to be, we're doing a, a live table read of it here on the one year anniversary of the Charlie Brown Apocalypse table read on the main stage <coughs> um, on Sunday, December 30th at 6 o'clock. Uh, the working title of it, if you go to the Pit website, is called Matt Freed's Haddonfield Weezer Project. Um, <laughs> But it is, uh, if I could disclose, if I could disclose it to the audience of the Pitcast, um, it is a new sitcom that I'm working on about a young gentleman who um, accidentally falls into a coma when he's 15 years old, and then wakes up to wakes up 15 years later to be 30 years old, and he hasn't even kissed a girl yet, while all of his other friends have gotten their shit together, and hilarity ensues. Shenanigans. I Shenanigans. But I'm working on that right now. Um, and that'll be, and that will be uh, happening in December on December third, Sunday, December thirtieth, six o'clock on the pit main stage. So I'm pretty uh, excited for that. So yeah. Well, cool. Well, cool. well, thanks, man. Thanks for being my first guest. Thanks for having me, Mark Thank Stetson. You. Thank you. It's like Studio Three Sixty, but at the pit. But at the pit. But at the pit. And I just stopped. I just dumped water everywhere. Nice. Afraid. So I decided to do something a little different with Phil's interview. I, uh, I wanted to interview him at the pit bar, at the love bar, right after the show. Uh, and what I did not anticipate was uh, how loud and chaotic that bar can get around 11.30 at night. So, um, so uh, you may have to strain a little bit to hear what, what we're saying, but uh, we eventually ended up moving up to the loft. So um, let me know what you think. So, I'm here with Bill Cazal. Hey. Charlie Brown in... Charlie Brown Apocalypse. Actually, Chuck Black. Chuck Black. For copyright like, purposes. For copyright uh, purposes. We don't want the pit to be subject to anything. No, I mean, you wouldn't. I mean, you were Linus. Uh, well, you were Minus. Well, minus. minus. Well, minus. Copyright. Right. Yeah, copyright. 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 Bill, you, uh, you guys just finished the second run. Yes. Um, how do you feel about the process? It was awesome. It was really awesome. Like, I've never been a part of something where, from beginning to end, you got to see whole process, like being in the eye of the storm, you know, it was really fun, it was, it was really, really fun because I love messing up once in a while and seeing him, him twitch in the background, I'm like, oh, I'm affecting his process, I, I, I fucked up, ah, but I mean, I, I feel responsible, I feel bad, like sometimes, because you, know, you want to do a good job, of you course. have a writer there, and it's Matt, he's one of the nicest guys, yeah. so you don't want to, you don't want to mess with him. Of course not. In Beat Truck Black, um, you, you, you were in pretty much every scene. What was that like for you? It was awesome. It was a. I felt responsible because I had to know my lines. Uh, but I've I've done it. You know, I I did a lot of high school community theater where I was <laughs> the lead in a Godspell. I was Jesus. Uh, really? Was, uh, I was Jesus. Yeah, I was Jesus. So, uh, so you can sing. I can sing. With the theme of the show being about the pop, what is? What was your feeling being the central character in this show with this potentially historical event coming up? I don't know. I'm a ham. I like being on stage. I like being on stage a lot. This was a perfect outlet because also Matt kind of wrote the part and tailored it to my, you know, my personality. Like, I don't know what you're, what are you, we're recording Lissa, Lissa Mandel is trying to moderate the discussion and say that I'm not answering the question. And I would like to uh, I would like to answer your question. It was it was really cool being a part of that. I know that it's bullshit. The world is not going to end. But I love how as the year went by, all of his jokes happened. Like, listen, as an example, we were all present for the first few jokes that sort of became apparent like as the conservatives went slowly nuts over 2012, um, a lot of stuff came true that was in the script, um, or things became more topic. Uh, like, like, like abortion, contraceptive, yeah. um, any of the Obama jokes, pretty much. I mean, yeah, I was going for it, but from the beginning. But there was a lot of stuff in there that started to take place, or maybe it's just politics, you can kind of guess the meat more or less, because right. it's, it's vaguely predictable. Concentrate answer the question because we have music that you would hear an Abercrombie and Fitch play. 
Langston took over the iPod and now. Langston, who was in, who was in Tribe Mike? He was, he was your part. Well, it's not my part anymore. Oh, uh, well, well, you know, you started it. You're the first. This music is getting louder. Yeah, we're in the loft on a couch. Yeah. We tried at the bar, but. Uh, Langston's playing techno. I felt like I was an Abercrombie and Fitch. <laughs> I felt like I was never proud of such. Yeah, um, he actually took his shirt off and started walking around. He was doing that. Yeah. It was happening. So, Phil Cassell. 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 The optimistic, idealistic, um, Bible-thumping Chuck Black. How do you feel that the show's evolved? Um, I think we've all got much more comfortable, and we've kind of become a bunch of little kids. We've all kind of formed our little... Alliances and fraternities with people. It's it's great because we've had a chance to become kind of a, a friendship family of sorts, you know, like all those guys. They're all gonna hang out the next day after the apocalypse, you know? We became those guys. And we were it was very closely characterized. Like he tailored it to all of us. Like I am a big softy pushover. But what I really liked about Charlie Brown is that he's this very religious guy. And unlike most media, they didn't he didn't portray him as some sort of blowhard with no sense of humor who was like just the one that people aren't gonna like. Because lately it's always like the religious nut is a, is that. He's a religious nut. He's not just religious and then. Or he is a person who is religious. That's what I liked about this. This is one of those rare opportunities where yeah. he sort of he sort of like fleshed him out. Yeah, and and sure, like he's a pushover, but at the same time, there's was one thing that he would not yeah. deviate from. No, no, and that's I relate to that because um, I love Halloween. It's my favorite <laughs> favorite holiday. I mean, ask anybody. I do shows around Halloween here, and I'm obsessed with it always being the Halloween weekend. We always do it this way, and you know, I've. I've been in his situation where it's like his favorite thing in the world, and people are passionate about it, but it's not his level of fanaticism. And so I, <laughs> you know, he kind of loses his shit. I, I'm that guy. I've been in there. Like, just always, that's it. Anything else? I don't care. I guess you could say he's a pushover and that, like, he goes with it. But that, that was really where I gravitated towards the part. I'm like, I understand. This makes sense. Because of Halloween. So, you did Welcome uh, to Hell. We did Welcome to Hell, uh, which is our, uh, me and BJ Thorne and Chris Aurelio's project, where we are a talk show in hell. Uh, BJ is Vincent Wells, which is an amalgamation of Vincent Price and uh, Orson Wells, you know, the sort of egotistical older actor who's trapped in hell, and he's forced to run a talk show for all eternity. I'm his werewolf sidekick. I have a band, which is all of the bartenders at the pit who live in a uh, loft together. They all live in a loft together. Do you realize that? The monkeys, if they were rebooted today, would be the pit bartenders. <laughs> um, except there's six of them. They're all, I think they're all slowly moving out of one place because they started in one area and now they're spawning outwards. Wow. Uh, like a virus. Like a, a lovely friendship virus. Yeah, a, a great like, virus that, that, that sometimes gives you a little bit of a heavy pork. And it's sometimes shirtless. Uh, right, uh, apparently. I've, I've seen all of them without their shirts. At some point, here, it's, I, I don't know how. Uh, I never asked for it. Why would you? I don't know. It just sort of happens. But you enjoyed it, though. It was all right. I, yeah. I felt calm. I felt calm when Michael is shirtless. Uh, it, there's there's a, a sort of a calm. Like this is yeah. a man, domestic man amongst us. I, I kind of have always assumed that was the way that he yeah. was shirtless. That's it. He he has this very quiet like demeanor, and I would just have to imagine that. that Transfers over to his upper nudist oh, yeah. nature. I think so. I feel like that just sort of goes with it. And uh, it uh, for Welcome to Hell, he's our drummer. And we only have him perform shirtless and with eye makeup. So if you go to Welcome to Hell this Saturday uh, at 11 o'clock at the pit, um, you will see a shirtless Michael Carbonati with makeup on his eyes and playing the drums like, like a champ. <laughs> just rippling muscles just, and all that. Just like the bartender... Drum just, he's the, he is the yeah Ernest Hemingway, but friendlier. <laughs> like he's that he's got that level, but you know, not horribly suicidal and uh, angry at all all the time. Like, like he's like the opposite, like happy, loving life. Yeah. Let's get back to the show. Let's get back to Charlie Brown Apocalypse. So tonight was the the final show of 2012, yes. but potentially ever. We have since, possibly since Matt Fried is uh, in fact is in fact um, yes to the. 
um, to the disappointment of uh, most of the female race. He's going to L.A. He's going to L.A. He's going to L.A. He's moving yeah, to L.A. He's moving to L.A. next year. Yeah. Listen, apparently. Was, was, Listen, we got a friend on the inside now. He'll be okay. He's he is moving to L.A. Yeah. Shit. Yeah, man. That damn straight. Well, that's sad. It's, yeah, what am I going to have a lead role written for me ever again? I, I don't see that happening soon. Uh, so, you know, there's that. But this cast, I've, they've all become my friend, my, like, some of my, my best friends. I mean, my, my girlfriend. Yeah. yeah. For starters. For starters, I got another job out of this show, which was great. So much stuff came from this show, for me and for everybody else. Um, that's going to be, you know, hard to leave behind, but I feel like it's good. We've been here for a solid year, and I feel like anything longer than that, we're just overstaying or welcome in the parts. Somebody else is going to need it more than us. Some other cast someday. And then they'll connect, and then they'll become yeah. friends, and it'll be great for them. And yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's like Pete's Dragon. It's like it's like, exactly Pete's Dragon. It's like some other kid is going to need, you know, is going to need a dragon yeah. to help him through. It's, and if someone, some other kid's going to need to yeah. have an apocalypse to help or, him through. The other Pete, and Pete, Pete, when when Artie leaves, right? Some little Viking is going to need his help one day. That's right. And he's going to, and Artie is going to have to take him to the next level. And it's, it's, yeah, I mean, everyone needs the strongest man in the world. This show. Took me to another level of not not acting. Yeah. I mean, acting yes, because any time that you're on stage for an extended period, it's good. You're getting your reps in, but it showed me what a cast could be. By the time you're listening to this podcast, the Welcome to Hell show that Phil was talking about uh, has already passed, unfortunately. But um, the show was incredible. Um, had a huge house and. Um, yeah, they're hoping to bring it back um, sometime in the new year. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, also keep an eye out for Matt Freed. So because if you see him, um, make sure to say to say hi and um, wish him luck in LA because he is leaving in late March, early April uh, to go and uh, try his hand in La La Land. And of course, make sure to listen to the actual Pitcast with Ileana and Mo of the Day Camp Kids. And, uh, yeah, just keep listening and keep taking classes. Keep performing. As Matt Freed says, put up or shut up. <laughs>